This passage in Acts 20 is such a moving passage as Paul, who has planted this Ephesian church, speaks for the last time with the elders who will continue to serve that church in his absence. And he really expresses his heartfelt love and desire for them that they would continue in the ways that he had taught them. And this morning, as we seek to ordain five brothers to office here in Providence, we'll focus our attention on verse 28 of this passage. Acts 20, 28 will be our text. There Paul says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Surely the word of the Lord stands sure. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, every Sunday morning worship is special. Every Sunday morning, we're given the privilege of coming into the house of the Lord, being together with His people, and we're given the opportunity to hear His Word read and proclaimed. Our hearts are moved to sing His praises, and we're blessed to be able to enjoy that in safety and peace from week to week. So every worship service is special, but this morning's worship service is particularly so. And that's because following the sermon... Five of our brothers will be ordained as office bearers here in Providence. Now, this isn't a terribly uncommon occurrence. The reality is we do this every spring after all. But that doesn't mean that it isn't a a genuinely special occasion. And that's because if we consider what these brothers really represent, if we consider them in the light of the teaching of Scripture, then what we'll see is that What these brothers really are is evidence of God's continued care for and evidence of God's continued love for His people. And in that sense, these men are are very much a gift. These men are very much a blessing that we receive from the hand of the Lord. But if we're going to appreciate that, if we're really going to understand the, the nature and the scope of this blessing, then we're going to need to have some understanding We're going to need to have some understanding of of how it is that we've received these men, and we're also going to need to have some understanding of how they are intended to to play a role within the life of the church. And as always, when we are in need of understanding and instruction, we do well to turn to the Scriptures, and we do so knowing that in the pages of His most holy word, God has revealed all that is necessary for us to carry out our Christian calling and to live the Christian life. So this morning we're going to consider what Luke has recorded for us in the book of Acts, in Acts 20, 28. There we hear this admonition of the Apostle Paul, and as we consider this particular verse this morning, we'll do so with the goal of of learning more about the provision and the place of these men who have been called to be watchmen here in Providence. And as we consider this verse, we're going to try to answer two particular questions this morning. Question number one, how is it that we've come to have watchmen in the church? How is it that we've come to have watchmen in the church? And question number two, what are the responsibilities of these watchmen? So how have we come to have watchmen in the church and what are their responsibilities? What is their role? What is their calling and their task? Now, a few moments ago, I noted that the ordination of office bearers isn't a terribly uncommon activity for us. It is, as I noted, something that we do each and every spring round about this time. And because it's such a a regular event, because it's such a scheduled event, it may be that it's come to feel less like the ordaining of things and more like the organization of things. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you were to stop and think about any larger, long-standing institution, if you were to think about a church or if you were to think about a, a company, it's just natural that over time there's, there's going to be a certain amount of organization, there's going to be a certain amount of structuring that's going to occur. So, for instance, if you have a business, it's inevitable that as that business grows, as it develops, that There are going to be governmental policies. There are going to be procedures that are put in place. And as part of that process, it's almost inevitable that that a company will appoint officers. 
And so a company might suddenly find itself with a CEO, they might find themselves with a CFO or vice presidents or various mid-level managers. And the point is that, that these things just happen naturally. They happen over time and they do so as that organization gets larger and as it gets more complex. And so we might come to think that the same thing is also true of these watchmen, these overseers of the church. We might come to think that the the reason that we have officers in the church is because over time, as the church has grown, as the church has matured as an institution, that, that we as a people have just sensibly chosen to appoint these officers and to give them a certain amount of authority and responsible and that all of this is just part and parcel of, of the good government and the good operation of the church. And I think that in some respects that that uh, it might be the case that the fact that we choose these men by way of a, of a vote, that that actually can, can work to reinforce this notion. This notion that these brothers, that they're here as a result of our call, that they're here as a result of our choice, that perhaps we've called them to serve a function that's beneficial to us all, maybe to represent our particular interests or desires. But loved one, here's the thing. That's not the case at all. These men are not here this morning because we have decided as a people that that this is a sensible thing to do. These men are not here this morning because we've decided that there should be officers in the church. And they're not here this morning because we have been the one to determine that these five brothers are the men who who are best suited to serving our needs and to representing our interests. Now, these men are here this morning because in His sovereign good grace and in His sovereign good pleasure, God has decided to give them to us as a gift, as a blessing from His hand. He is the one who has determined that that His church ought to be served by overseers. And He's been the one to determine, not just that we should have overseers in some sort of conceptual way, but He is the one who has determined that these five men, that these five men will serve Him here in Providence in that capacity. How do we know that? How do we know that these men haven't been chosen by men, but that these men have in fact been chosen by God, that these men have been given to us by our Heavenly Father. Well, we know that because this is what the Scriptures teach us. Look with me again at at verse 28 at our text. and Recall what Paul says to these Ephesian elders. These are men to whom Paul had taught the gospel. These were men who, who Paul had himself been personally responsible to bringing to faith. These were also men who were elders in the church, and almost certainly these men had been, had been appointed to that task by Paul. Paul was the one who, for instance, speaks to, to Timothy and says, appoint elders in every place. Make sure that there are elders in every church. And so Paul is responsible from a human perspective for the faith and the understanding of these men. From a human perspective, he's the one who showed up and said there need to be elders and find these type of guys and appoint those men and ordain them. And yet, how does Paul speak about these brothers? Does he suggest that they're there because he thought it was a good idea to organize the church this way? Does he speak of them as being men whom he had personally identified as being fit for the task? No. That's not how he speaks about them at all. In verse 28, he says that it was not him, but it was the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit who had made these men overseers. It was the Holy Spirit who had called them. It was the Holy Spirit who had ordained them. It was the Holy Spirit who had supplied these men with everything that they had need of in order to carry out their calling. And the Scriptures make it clear that that what was true for the overseers in the New Testament was also true for the watchmen in the Old Testament. We took a moment to to read from the book of Ezekiel today, and you could look at two portions, actually, in this regard. You could look at Ezekiel chapter 3, 16. You could also look at the portion that we read from Ezekiel 33, and it's clear in these verses that it is the Lord who had made Ezekiel a watchman. The Lord takes personal responsibility for this. He says to Ezekiel, I am the one who has made you a watchman in Israel. 
And so what we need to understand is that these brothers are here, not because we've called them, not because we thought it was a good idea. No, these brothers are here, they are present, and they are being ordained because they have been raised up by the Holy Spirit. They have been given to us as a gift of the living God. And so the question then becomes, well, why is that so? Why does God make this provision? Why does he give us overseers? And and why does he take such a personal interest in selecting these men? Well, once again, that's something that, that Paul touches on here in this verse. And he does so when he reminds these Ephesian elders that the church over which they had been given oversight, that that church did not belong to them. It wasn't their church, but... No, that church belonged to God. And Paul makes it clear that ownership of that church was something that God had paid dearly to obtain. Because what Paul reminds us here in this passage is that the purchase price of the church was nothing less than the shed blood of his son. Now, brothers and sisters, there's, there's just so much that has actually been packed into this verse, particularly to the conclusion of verse 28. And we would be completely remiss if we didn't at least pause for a moment and take note of the fact that there is such an incredible testimony here in this verse of how Jesus of Nazareth was not just a man, but how he was also the Son of God. Notice what Paul says here. He says that the church, the church is the church of God, and that church has been obtained by his own blood. The church has been bought, the church has been paid for by the blood of God. Well, how could that be if Jesus wasn't just human but also divine? How could that be the case unless the one who died on the cross, the one who shed his blood on Calvary's hill, wasn't just the son of David but was also the eternal son of God himself? There is such a powerful testimony here of the fact that Jesus is a complete and total Savior because he was both the Son of Man and the Son of God. In addition to this testimony of Christ's divinity, however, there's also such a wonderful declaration here about the extent to which Jesus loved the church. Brothers and sisters, I wonder if that's something that we think about enough. Do we think enough about how much Jesus loved the church? Do we think enough about how important the church was to him? Do we think, for instance, about how dedicated Jesus was to the cause of building his church? Do we remember that 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 was the exclusive focus of his efforts right from the very outset of his ministry? In each of the Gospels, we're reminded that as Jesus took up his task, he came proclaiming the kingdom of God. And throughout the whole of his ministry, what did he do? He called people to come out of darkness and to come into the light of his kingdom and to dwell with him there. We could just think, for instance, even about the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount in which Jesus does what? In which he lays out the constitution of that kingdom. And there he speaks so beautifully about about the blessings and about the responsibilities of, of being a citizen in that kingdom. And that Sermon on the Mount, it was really the foundation of Jesus' earthly ministry. But here's the thing, Jesus didn't just build that kingdom, he also loved it. He loved that kingdom so much, so much that he was willing to lay aside his eternal glory that he was willing to come into this world and that he was willing to take upon himself the frailty of our human flesh. He loved the church so much that he subjected himself to the the daily suffering of of being the only righteous man who walked every step he took and and drew every breath that he took uh, amongst uh, the midst of a faithless generation. He loved the church so much that He was willing to hand himself over to his enemies and to be condemned to death by them. He loved the church so much that he was willing to be nailed to a cross, that he was willing to be cursed, to be utterly cast out by both God and man, that he was willing to shed his blood as a way of paying the cost of ransoming God's people from their sins and from condemnation. And here's the thing about Jesus, his love for the church, it it didn't end, it didn't cease after he had laid down his life for it. 
No, even as he was taken out of this world, even as Jesus was lifted up into glory to sit at his Father's right hand, he continued to love his people and he continued to provide for them. Now, that provision, it, it came first of all in, in the sending of the Holy Spirit, the sending of the Comforter, the, the Counselor, the, the Spirit of the living God is sent to dwell within the hearts of his people. And the Holy Spirit, he works within our hearts to, to comfort us as we endure the exile of walking through this world. And, and how does he do that? Well, he does that by constantly uniting the, the hearts of, of his children with Jesus Christ himself. He does that by transforming our hearts so that they're made to conform to the image of our Savior. But the Holy Spirit, He doesn't just work in the hearts of God's people. He also works in the church. He works in the midst of God's people. And, and a key part of His work involves raising up men to serve as overseers for Christ's people. And that is a profound act of love. That's a profound act of care and provision on Christ's part. Because what Christ understood was in his physical absence, as he was taken from us and as he ascended into glory, he understood that in his physical absence that his beloved church was going to face trial. He understood that there were going to be temptations and afflictions and hardships. And he knew how fierce those afflictions were going to be. Indeed, during the course of his earthly ministry, Jesus spoke about the hatred that men would have for the church. You recall what Jesus says to his disciples. He says, the world has hated me, but that's nothing compared to how the world is going to hate you. And Jesus understood. He understood that, that there would be consequences to his ascension. He understood that when Satan could no longer attack him, when Satan could no longer afflict him and tempt him, that he would turn his rage on the church and Jesus understood that the rage of the dragon was going to be so much more ferocious because he understood that with the ascension of Jesus Christ, he'd been defeated. He understood that his time was short, and so he would be all the more ferocious as a result. And knowing that the church was going to endure these afflictions, Jesus took steps. He took steps to protect and to preserve the church that he'd built and that he had loved and that he had purchased with his own blood. He took steps to make sure that the church was going to be able to endure those afflictions. And a key part of that provision was providing the church with under-shepherds. Under-shepherds who would continue his ministry here on earth. And how would they do that? Well, they would continue his, his own ministry by proclaiming the gospel. And as they proclaimed the gospel, they would continue that work of calling people out of darkness to stand in the light of Christ's kingdom. But those overseers, those watchmen, those office bearers, they would also continue his ministry by protecting the flock, by preserving them and ensuring that the church remained until the day of his return. The presence of overseers in the church then, it's not a matter, brothers and sisters, of human organization or convenience. No, it's a matter of divine ordinance. This is the will of God. More than that is, it is an expression of Christ's love for the church. A church that he bought with his own precious blood. And it's so important for us to understand that, brothers and sisters. It's so important for us to be clear about how it is that we have received these brothers in our midst. And we need to be clear about the fact that receiving these brothers is a blessing. It is a gift from the Lord. Because if we're clear about how we have received them in the church, then that is going to have a profound impact on how we receive them in our lives and in our homes. Loved ones, the scriptures have rather a lot to say about how we as Christians are to interact with the overseers who have been given to us by the Lord. Now, this morning we'll just pick two examples, but if you were to look at 1 Timothy 5, 17, what Paul says there is that the overseers, that they are worthy of receiving double honor from God's people. They are worthy of our utmost respect. They are worthy of double honor. And the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 13, 17 says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give account. Let them do this with joy, not with groaning, 
for that would be of no advantage to you. And so we're taught here that that these brothers, and indeed all the brothers who serve us here in Providence, that they're worthy of our honor, they are worthy of our respect, that we are to submit to them, that we're to do so easily and joyfully. But honoring them, submitting to them, and making it easy for them to do their work joyfully, that is only going to happen if we are absolutely clear about how their presence in the church is a reflection of God's will. And it's a reflection of God's providential care. And it's a reflection of our Savior's love. We are only going to treat these men in the way that we've been called to treat them if we understood where they have come from and how we receive them. Well, all right, what is that going to look like practically? What will it actually look like to submit willingly? What will it look like to submit joyfully to the oversight of these brothers? Well, it will begin with prayer. It will begin with prayer. We need to be praying for the elders and for the deacons here in Providence. We need to be asking God to give them a double portion of His Spirit so that they are richly supplied. Richly supplied with the wisdom, with the insight, with the understanding, with the energy and the strength that they need to to carry out their work here in our midst. It should be a regular part of our prayer. How do we treat these men with double honor? By regularly praying for them. And by asking the Lord to guide them and to keep them and to care for them. We will also show them proper honor, respect, and submission if we don't grumble against them. I know this is so easy to do. It's so easy to to look at the, the way that these men work and the way that they carry out their task. It's so easy to look at the decisions they have made or the decisions that they haven't made and to become angry, to become frustrated, to become bitter. Again, that idea that we sometimes have that we voted for these brothers and we put them into office and now they're not behaving like we thought they would. It's so easy, brothers and sisters, for us to criticize them for their failings and their shortcomings. But if we're to understand that they're truly here by divine ordinance, that they're truly here as an expression of God's love and care for us, then we need to fight against those thoughts. We need to seek to go to war with those thoughts. At a minimum, we need to keep those thoughts to ourselves. And what we need to do is we need to strive to to think graciously about the office bearers. We need to strive to, to think positively about them and to speak positively about them. As you make your way through the congregation, it can be so easy on a Sunday night or a Friday night when you're gathered together and you're having conversation and the topic turns toward church and the next thing you know, you're laying into the consistory or you're laying into the council and all their shortcomings. Brothers and sisters, we have to hold each other to account on this. When that type of talk begins to happen, when, when that takes over in our discussions, we've got to pull back from that. We've got to think again about how these men have been called to serve and who they've been given to us by and the responsibilities that they have. It's not just a matter of of speaking about them with respect, however. It's also a matter of treating them with respect. And one of the key ways in which you can do this is by making yourself available to them. When the phone rings or the text dings or the email hits your inbox and it's an office bearer, it's an office bearer who's asking to speak with you or to meet with you, then reply. Reply, make yourself available to them. Don't hide from them. And I really want to say this to the young people of the church who are between the ages of about 19 and 30. Don't make your office bearer chase you down. Don't make him hunt for you. Make yourself available to these men and to the families of the congregation, especially when it's home visit time. Make yourself available to these brothers. The work of home visits is hard. It's not easy. You understand that, right? That these brothers are out all day long. They're working about their daily jobs. They're out in the sun and in the heat and in the cars and in offices. They have all of those stresses of their daily work. And then they come home, they wolf down a bit of supper, they're out the door, and they're in your living room. And they're not in their living room. They're not with their wives, with their children, with their families. They're with you. And they're there to care for you and to love you. They're there to encourage you in the race of faith. Don't make it harder by making a home visit a difficult thing to schedule. Remember, brothers and sisters, when you receive communication from the office bearers in this church, who it is that is actually asking to meet with you. 
These are the spirit-appointed under-shepherds of Jesus Christ. They've been given to the church as an act of love and care on his part. When the elders call you, it is Jesus seeking to work through them to reach out into your life. When the deacons call you, it is Jesus reaching out to show you mercy in your life. Don't make these brothers run after you. And don't just, don't just make yourself available to them, but listen to them. They're men. They're weak. There's going to be shortcomings. There's going to be limitations. There's going to be times when they get it wrong, for sure. But listen to them. Meditate on what they have to say. Do your best to follow godly advice and direction when it's given to you. Don't just let what they have to say go in one ear and out the other, but hear them and hear in their words an expression of Christ's love for you. Do these things, beloved, knowing that these men undertake their labors for your good. Because the great king and the head of the church who loved you so much that he purchased you with his own blood, he is the one who has actually ordained things to work this way. Well, this verse, however, it doesn't just contain a, a calling for us as a congregation. There's also a calling here for the brothers who are about to take up their office. And that leads us to our second thought for this morning. If the overseers are to be a blessing to the church, what are their responsibilities? What are their duties within the congregation? Well, in this regard, Paul makes it clear that the overseers of the church, they have two key responsibilities. What are those two key responsibilities? They are in the first place to take heed to the flock, but they are also to take heed to themselves. Now that phrase, take heed, what it means is to be on guard. So that means that the office bearers have two responsibilities. They have to guard the flock here in Providence, but they also have to guard themselves. And as we seek to understand what it means to take heed and, and to guard, we're helped here by the image of an Old Testament watchman. There's an analogy here between watchmen and overseers, and the thing that links them together is that idea of seeing, right? The watchmen are seeing intently. The overseers are seeing intently. There's an alertness. There's an awareness. There's vision, and that's what connects these things. Well, if we think about the Old Testament image of a watchman, it will be very helpful, and it will be helpful because there are a number of, of key ways in which people who, who were watchmen in ancient cities undertook their task. So first of all, what we need to know is this. Watchmen in ancient cities had two jobs. The first of those jobs was to stand on the walls of that city and to be alert for the invasion of enemies and of foes. Now, it's an interesting thing. If you could travel back in time to an ancient city, cities were essentially the, the same for thousands of years. If you got back to an ancient city, what you would discover were high, thick walls that the community had invested together in, in building. These were massive building projects that were undertaken by the community, and they really defined the city's sense of identity and safety and protection. What you would discover are not only high city walls, but what you would discover is that, that any barriers had been cut back from the city for a long distance. All the forest would have been cleared away. All the rocks would have been cleared away. The land would have been relatively smooth and open for a significant distance beyond those walls. And that was because what cities wanted was to be able to see invaders coming. And so what they would do is they would appoint men to serve as watchmen, and the watchmen would stand on those walls, and they would look out at the distance, and they would be alert. They would look for any uh, sign of a, a flashing bit of metal. They would listen very intently to hear if there were horses coming in the distance. And the goal of those watchmen was to see the threat coming in advance. And you would see the threat coming in advance and you would sound the alarm. And what that would do is it would give the community time, time to rouse themselves, time to ready themselves, time to prepare to repel any invaders. Well, brothers and sisters, what we need to understand is that this church is like a city. It's the city of God. And there are walls in this church and these men have been placed on those walls and they are watchmen. And what they need to be alert to is, is to the reality that what Satan is trying to do is to breach these walls. He wants to attack. He wants to attack suddenly and, and at unawares. And what he wants to do is to breach those walls and tear them down and come inside and take control of the city and drag everyone who has been brought into the kingdom of light back into the city of darkness. 
That is what Satan is seeking to do. And when Satan attacks from outside, when he launches external attacks on the church, he has a tendency to use blunt force trauma. When Satan attacks from outside the church, he has a tendency to hit hard. And so what are Satan's main weapons in this regard? Well, what he has a tendency to try to do is to turn society against the church. He has a tendency to create such secular pressures that the church becomes hated and it becomes maligned. And then the church is assaulted, assaulted from the outside by people who are citizens of the kingdom of darkness rather than citizens of light. And what he wants to do is to tear down those walls and to come inside and to lay claim to the people. Well, you brothers, you brothers have the responsibility to protect us from those attacks. You have a responsibility to defend us, to warn us, so that as a community we can be prepared to resist Satan's assaults. You've been called to protect the sheep from being scattered by the power of the devil. These ancient cities then, they had watchmen who stood on the walls, but the watchmen had another function. Watchmen didn't just stand on the walls and look outside of the city. They also worked inside the city. Watchmen had the task of patrolling the city streets and doing so particularly at night. Interestingly, we actually find a biblical uh, description of this in the Song of Songs of all places. You remember when we studied the Song of Songs and the beloved goes out seeking her, her, her partner. She goes out seeking her beloved and she's in the city streets and she is found by the city watch. And the city watch are patrolling the streets then. The watchman's duty then included not just protecting the, 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 the city against external attacks, but keeping peace with inside the city walls. And here we need to understand that Satan is a crafty foe. He doesn't just attack from the outside, he attacks from the inside as well. In fact, some of his most deadly attacks come from within inside the church, and some of the times that Satan is most effective is when he sets brothers and sisters against each other. Now, what is different here is that when Satan attacks inside the church, he tends to use subtlety rather than blunt force trauma. When Satan attacks from inside the church, he has a tendency to play the long game. He plants seeds, seeds of false teaching. He plants as seeds as well by by chipping away at the holiness of our lifestyle, of our commitment to live the Christian life. He attacks by turning people against each other. One of the most effective ways Satan can attack is by turning office bearers against the sheep. By turning the watchman and the sheep against each other so that they're at odds. This is one of the reasons why it's so important that we speak well of the office bearers and that we're not speaking negatively about them. Because when we do, we're sowing those little seeds of discord that Satan can capitalize upon to turn us against each other. And so, brothers, you then have a responsibility not only to guard the walls and to look for external threats, but to guard the streets, to be busy inside of the church looking for any threats or deviations that would lead us away from the Word of God and from His truth. Brothers and sisters, what, it makes, what the Scriptures make clear is that as you take on this task that you are accountable, you are accountable not to men. You do not owe an explanation to me or to the brothers and sisters of this church. You are accountable to the living God. And he will hold you accountable for whether you have rightly sounded the warning against the threats that might imperil this church community. Well, that is a tremendous responsibility. It's a tremendous responsibility that falls upon these brothers. It's a tremendous thing to be held accountable by the living God. And if you're going to do that well, brothers, then then it is also the case that there is a second calling that falls upon you. And that is that you must not only take heed to the church, but you must take heed to yourselves. You must also guard yourselves. And so, brothers, if you're going to undertake this work of being a watchman here in Providence seriously, then you need to understand that you won't ever be able to faithfully shepherd the sheep if you are not first first of all faithfully shepherding your own heart. And so what does that mean? What does that mean for for you? you? What does it mean to take heed for yourself? Brothers, you need to understand that it begins with a personal fidelity to Christ. It begins with a personal devotion to Him and to His service. It begins with knowing who your Savior is. 
that you understand who Jesus is and not just what he has done for the church, but what he has done for you and what he has accomplished in your life. And that knowing who he is and knowing what he has done for you, that that your heart is filled with a love for him, that your heart is filled with a devotion for him. It continues not just with a, a, a personal love and devotion to Christ, but a personal fidelity to his word and his will. How will you go about guarding the flock? How will you go about keeping the sheep here safe if you are not conscious of what the threats are? And in order to be conscious of what those threats are, you need to know what the will of God is. You need to know what the Word of God is. And so there's a calling here, brothers, to strive to understand the gospel. There's a calling here to strive to be able to not just understand the gospel, but to be able to teach it, to be able to articulate it and defend it and to set it before the hearts of men. There's also here a call to faithfulness in your own life. The brothers who serve as watchmen here in Providence, they need to understand that they've been called to be personal examples of faith that, that, the, sheep, that the sheep here in Providence can imitate. Paul does that here in this passage. As he is parted from the Ephesian elders, what does he say to them? He says, think of me. Think of me and how I have served. Think of me and how I have labored faithfully amongst you. Think of me and how I've not sought my, my own advantage or my own gain, but think about how I have done nothing but devote myself to your service. Think of how I have never in season and out of season ever failed to preach anything to you that was other than the word of God and that was other than profitable for your salvation. Paul, on this opportunity, this last occasion, he calls the elders of Ephesus to imitate him as he had been imitating Christ. And so, brothers, there's a call here to fidelity in your own life, a holiness of life that is evident to others. There's a call here to, to show a willingness to serve, even at great cost for yourself. Paul speaks about that here. I asked nothing of you. I provided for myself and all who were with me. I was a servant, says Paul, in your midst, and I labored in that way. Finally, one further admonition in this regard, there's a call here to set a guard at your own mouth. We've spoken about how it is that the sheep need to speak about the under-shepherds, but it is also true that the under-shepherds must speak carefully about the sheep. As you interact with those in your care, it's so very important that you keep their confidences, that you, that you are trustworthy in being able to, to interact with the congregation, that they can share their hearts with you. There's also a call here, brothers, not to complain about the sheep. It can be easy sometimes for the sheep to complain about the shepherds, I know, but it can also be easy for the shepherds to complain about the sheep, to talk about them, about how unwilling they are and how slow to heed they are. We have to, we have to resist that, brothers. We have to speak lovingly and positively about the sheep in our care. So this is the task that, that Paul lays before you as watchmen. You must guard against external threat. You must guard against internal division and upheaval. And while you are doing that, the success of that venture depends on first guarding yourself and guarding your own heart and your own mind. It is a great task, brothers and sisters. It's a great task for us as a congregation to receive these men faithfully and well. It's a great calling for them to undertake their work in our midst. And in both of these cases, it's so far beyond our ability it's so far beyond our capacity to do what we've been called to do, but we don't need to despair. And we don't need to despair. Why? Because, because the Holy Spirit is present here in our midst. The Holy Spirit is the one who has enlightened the eyes of our hearts to, to understand the truth of the gospel and, and to see in Jesus Christ the great act of love on God's part and being willing to make atonement for our sins and shame. The Holy Spirit, who having enlightened us to that truth, has called us together, bound us together as a body. The Holy Spirit, who has raised up men from within our midst to serve as overseers. And that same Holy Spirit, who has done all this, will also enable us and fill us with the strength to carry out those very callings. He's the one who will enable us to be both sheep and shepherd, he is the one who will ensure that by his power and by his strength and by his might, we will be kept safe. Safe until the day of our Lord's coming, when once again we shall be united with him together in glory. Amen.